I don't harbor any grudges or ill feelings. Um, I just think that that relationship is stuck. And so I began to wonder what could I do about that. And I wonder how often uh, for many of us we have relationships or we are in situations where we just feel stuck. And so um, Ephesians 1 and 18 tells us, uh -oh, tells us that um, Paul prays that the eyes of our hearts may be enlightened in order that we will know the hope to which God has called us. And so I wonder how often when we feel stuck, do we pray for God to enlighten our hearts that we might know uh, how to move forward, um, what else we need to do. And so um, I invite us today, as we pray for our um, friends and families, as we send up our petitions for healing and comfort, that we would also ask the Holy Spirit to show us where our hearts need to be open. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we come before you. First of all, we just say thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for bringing us to this place of this house of prayer. And we ask you now, Lord, to open the eyes of our hearts, not just so that we can see you, but also so that you can show us us and show us how we need to move forward. We lift up prayers and petitions for those who are um, bereaved. We, we pray for healing and we pray for your provision for all those who are in need. And now we pause to name specifically those who we want to lift up in prayer. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are always present with us and that we can always cast our cares on you. And so again, we pray that you would be a comforter to those who are bereaved. We pray that you would be the healer for those who need healing. We pray that you would continue to be the provider for those in need. And we pray for you to be our protector we know you, Lord God, to be the one who makes the way out of no way. We love you and let all people say, Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. We continue to celebrate our differences, because sometimes we need to celebrate that we are different. We can't pretend that, that we all think the same, that we all walk the same, that we talk the same. And so um, as part of that, we have a special guest this morning, and it's a, a, a friend of mine. I've been knowing her for many, many years. She had the pleasure, well, I had the pleasure and the privilege of having her dance in my wedding. Um, and she's going to present to us um, some ethnic dances from, from my country, from Peru. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to, for, for you to get to see a little bit more of, of our culture. But she moved here when she was 15, and since then she's been able to attend school, she's been able to attend college. She is a nurse, she said for cardiac arrest, I believe, so uh, she's doing big things out there, she's saving lives. And um, I'm, I'm excited to have her here, and so I'm gonna welcome her um, now. This is Victoria. Oh, actually, I, sh I should uh, clarify that she's married into an Italian family, so I'm going to try to say this correctly. Borracci? Is that what it is? Okay, Victoria Borracci. <laughs>
Yes. Oh, y'all can do better than that. The mayors. Oh, that's just awesome. I thank you, Sister Victoria. Thank you so much. You know, uh, undoubtedly, after each gathering, someone will ask me, well, how was the church service? You know, and because we just approach God so dynamically, I just start sharing whatever it is we did. And by the time I'm like 10, 15 minutes, they got a look on their face like, I just want you to say it was all right. No, it's much more than all right. Hey, Amen. I, I just love how we, we celebrate and embrace our diversity. And I want you to know that's top down. That's top down. Amen. Amen. Thank you again, Sister Victoria. I mean, really, we are, we are definitely more alike than unalike because that dance there, I, it took me to some places myself. Amen. Amen. Worth celebrating. Is that right? Amen. That is one of the things we do here at Emmaus. It's part of our core passion of relationships. We celebrate each other. We just celebrate each other. That's a good thing, right? Right. So we make space. And so that space is open right now. We want to celebrate with you. If you have a birthday, an anniversary, maybe you just want to share something God did. This is your time. This is your place, your space. Come on forward. Come on forward. Oh, we have a young man and a lady here. All right. Come on, my dear. Come on up. Take your time. We got you. We got you. Come on up. Oh, look at you. Come on up. All right. All right. We got one over here. Let me help you. I'm going to start on this end. Good morning, my dear. Do share your name and celebration. Artiste Brown. And my celebration is my birthday was on the 9th, and I'm 69. Whoa! My birthday was October 9th. You're my birthday twin. Wow! It's a small world. I thought you was cool people. Congratulations. What you do to celebrate? Uh, dinner and a show. Low key. Dinner and a show is good. Low key is good. Good morning. Share your name and celebration. My name is Natasha Moore, and I'm celebrating. Yesterday was my two score and two. For those of you who don't know, it's 42. Birthday. You just confused me, but all right. <laughs> Congratulations. What would you do to celebrate? Um, my aunt took me out to lunch, and my niece took me out to dinner. Very good, very good. Why don't we make space? We'll go down just a little bit. I think this is a tandem celebration. I'm going to wait. I'll come down. Come on, young lady. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I remember when she was a little baby. We, remember we were on the retreat, and, and you went down the sled, and I was scared to go, but you went? Wow. That sounds about right, she said. Share your name and celebration. My name is Karen, but I'm more so celebrating for my parents. They have just made 30 years in business. Wow. 30 years in business. That's awesome. That is awesome. So... Of those 30 years, what have you learned the most from your parents? Patience. Patience, good. Congratulations. Y'all give them a hand. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'm not going to use the tagline from the commercial. <laughs> good morning, my dear. Good morning, Emmaus. I'm Charlene Gettings, and I'm celebrating my 59th birthday. It was October 10th. Wow, a day after. Good people. That's right. It's Libra season. You know, I don't always do this. I don't need the mic. You don't need the mic? I'll wait. All right, show your name and celebration. I am standing proxy for Lilia Sarai Marquez, that is my daughter. Tomorrow she turns two years old. Wow, time flies. Time flies. What are you going to do to celebrate for her? Um, I teach a class tomorrow evening, so we're, we're going to do a party for her later in the week. We'll, we'll figure it out. But the, the terrific twos have started, Saints. Pray for us. <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. I'm going to come over here because I always like to start with the better half. So do share. <laughs> That's love. That's love. Do share your name and celebration. Um, I'm Jean Miller, and I'm celebrating my... 59th birthday today. Wow, 59 look great. 
Hey, man, congratulations. So what are you going to do to celebrate? They won't tell me. So it's something today. My son is in from St. Louis from law school, and my daughter is here today. And so I have to wait as the day progresses and find well, out. Well, okay, that's a good thing. You know what? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press your hubby a little bit. Do, do you know what? You oh, you know. Since it's you. Yeah. Well, uh, a real quick celebration. My daughter was admitted, my daughter Jillian was admitted to the Chicago Portfolio School, so she's taking postgraduate work. So that's exciting. Um, and yeah, we got uh, a day full. We're going to go down and see uh, Monty Python play uh, today, called Spam a Lot, so that'll be fun and have dinner. And then, wait, there's more. On Tuesday, Jing and I are going to go see Hamilton. So, happy birthday. Always look on the bright side of life. <laughs> Congratulations. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, birthday people. Uh, uh, uh. Y'all, come on. I know, see, she's a dancer. I'm not. So I'm just going to stand here like. He said, okay. He didn't say you were dismissed. I know. Y'all got the dance. Birthday people, go ahead. <laughs> come on, Eugene, come on. All right. I'm not, no, she's gonna make me look one, bad. She's gonna two, make me look on. bad. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Amen. Give them all a hand. Amen. 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 Wow. Time flies. 30 years, huh? Elder Nate. Wow. That's awesome. Do me a favor. Turn your attention to the screens for some community announcements. Good morning, family. It's Jillian here, and these are your October 13, 2019 Emmaus Community Announcements. We remain close to our next. Our treasured 925 MacArthur Drive address will be changing over to 20820 Southwestern Avenue. Even with the phenomenal amount of generous giving we have received for the building fund, we remain short of our original stated financial goal. We still have so much to do associated with the move and we continue to welcome your generous donations to our next. For exploration, we have launched a new book series running on Thursdays during daytime Bible and brunch and evening exploration. We are reading Outdoing Jesus by Doug Paget, discovering together what it means to live into the promise that Jesus made to his disciples. Greater works will we do in his name. You can still get books at $15 each. You can purchase your copy after the gathering in the Fusion Cafe. Please note, from September through November, our epic gathering series will be focused around the Mosaic community, character, Christianity, church, and calling in the Book of Acts. Last week, we were honored and blessed by our guest speaker, Father Guillermo Campuzano. It was a spectacular Sunday epic gathering. Today, on the last day honoring Latino Heritage Month, our own Reverend Jesus Marquez will continue in this epic worship series, preaching from Acts 10. Stay tuned. Hey, Emmaus community, you know what comes in October? It's candy craze. However, this is a serious shout out for help. Let's say it again, help. We only have two weeks before candy craze and we need 30 trunks of cars decorated and full of candy, Emmaus style. You all know what that means. Additionally, we also need 40 volunteers to work on all the events and games indoors. Candy Craze serves our members and the surrounding community as well. We continue to collect unopened bags of candy for this signature Emmaus event that occurs this year on Sunday, October 27th. We do not have enough candy. We need more. Come on, Emmaus. You know how we do it. Please bring five bags of unopened candy and place them in the barrels in the front of the Fusion Cafe. Please see Reverend Isaac E. Hayes to volunteer. 
Hey family, new member classes are forming. New member classes will be held at the Emmaus community every Tuesday from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. beginning November 5th. The classes last for six weeks. 6.30 to 7 p.m. is food and fellowship. Then from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. we have conversation. If you are interested in participating, please see Kirsten Mahone immediately after the 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. services today and next Sunday, October 20th. Kirsten can be reached at krmj912 at gmail.com. That's krmj912 at gmail.com. As you all know, next Sunday, we are having an Emmaus field trip to the Universal Circus on Sunday, October 20th. The cost of the trip, including transportation, is $25 for adults and $20 for children. All money, without exception, is due today, Sunday, October 13th. Please see Reverend Isaac E. Hayes for more information. One last thing, you know how Pastor Elise always says we have the A-team and then the other A-team. Well, here's a small example of members of the Emmaus community showing out. Last Wednesday, our own Megan McNeil was flown out to Las Vegas to appear on the nationally televised Kelly Clarkson talk show on NBC. She was all that as usual. Then, if that wasn't enough, we just learned that another member of our community, our own Chelsea Carter, will be a contestant on this little Bravo TV show called Project Runway. What? Hey, Emmaus, we are out there doing things. Here at the Emmaus community, we are striving to be generous in our giving as a part of our biblical act of worship. We begin by simply obeying God with our tithes, believing for increase as we grow in faith to give beyond our 10%. So you can either drop your offering in the Emmaus giving baskets that are conveniently located in the back of the sanctuary, Fusion Cafe, and family viewing area, or you can mail your offering to the Emmaus Community, 925 MacArthur Drive, Chicago Heights, Illinois, 60411. Or you can use our convenient Givelify application on your mobile phone. Happy Sunday, everyone. Especially a special happy birthday shout out to my mom, Jean Miller. This is Jillian, and these have been your Emmaus Community announcements for Sunday, October 13th, 2019. Amen. Our hearts and minds are clear. We do have uh, a couple of emphasis behind the announcements. I want to invite Kirsten Mahone up. She'll have an emphasis regarding new members, and then I'll have one myself. Good morning, Emmaus. How are you guys today? Um, I had to laugh because, Pastor Jesus, your sermon, God never lets me get away with a joke. My sister calls me Cephas. Um, and when you were talking about Cephas, I said, oh, okay, I've got a bone to pick with somebody when I get home. So, because I am all facets of Peter, I will say that, you know, good and bad. Um, anyway, so new members classes will begin November 5th, okay? From 6.30 to 8.30, you heard the announcement. I am inviting everyone to join the family. Okay, I've been here for a long time. I'm actually the team leader for the new members classes. I was initially the co-leader for the new members classes when Emmaus started. I'm a member of the launch team. I wanna show you guys who I am with glasses because Paul Miller was so nice to show a picture of me without my glasses. I will be outside with the information so you guys can sign up. So are we good? Okay, perfect. Amen. Thank you, Kirsten. Also, uh, my emphasis, uh, I'm, I'm standing in proxy for uh, Reverend Isaac. You know, if you've been here long enough, you know that Candy Craze is a signature Emmaus event where we really, in a, just a particular way, reach out to the surrounding community. And what makes it work are the cars that ring the church. That's really, I mean, what we have going on inside is good as well, because we've got games and face painting and all of that. But the cars really make it work. And so we need, we need at least 40 volunteers 
to, to volunteer your car, to decorate it. And trust me, if you don't have any decorations, we've got some supplies for you in that, you know, along that as well. Also, just to volunteer your time um, for setup, setting up the face painting and other things that's going on. And then most importantly, men, where y'all at? Men, where y'all at? Yeah, you know what? We need men to secure the perimeter and the interior of the building. There are a lot of individuals. We, we love everybody. <laughs> we love everybody. But there are people in and around the building, right, that we might not necessarily know. No, no shade or nothing, just observation. We want to be able to protect and secure the building and the inhabitants of the building. And so... Uh, men, you'll be receiving uh, in the perimeter on the outside. You'll be re receiving an, an, an email if you're on the uh, man cave email blast. If not, you're getting the directive now. The information will be forthcoming. And so we're just also looking for some people to come forward and to canvas as well. We're going to be canvassing the neighborhood on October 21st. Um, some more information will be coming from uh, Reverend Isaac on that as well. Um, Yuri? Okay. Uh, more information. Candy Craze is an all hands on deck Emmaus event. Everybody clear? Good, good. Are there any visitors? If this is your first time at Emmaus, first time in a long time, we don't want to shame you. Just want to recognize you. Give us a hand wave. Where you at? Hey, I see you there. Welcome to Emmaus. Oh, I think I got one right here too. Brother Eric, I got another one. Was there one behind you? Did I see a hand? There's a hand back there. Normally I go, come on down. Uh, but listen, we are just so thankful that you are here, that you are here with us in this place, in this space. We do not take it lightly that you are here, as Pastor would say, that you thought it not a robbery to come to this, the house of prayer and praise. Uh, we have one right over here also. Um, so what you're receiving is a card that we want you to fill out. As I said earlier, <clears throat> one of our core passions is relationships. And so we want to connect with you beyond, beyond today. So if you fill that card out, there's a welcome table right outside this door, and you will be given a welcome gift. Uh, it'll have a, a video or a DVD of one of our former gatherings, as well as some other goodies in there. Amen. Amen. All hearts and minds are clear. I'd like to pray over our offering and we can move forward in our gathering. Amen. So God, we give back to you because you first gave back to us. It is truly our act of worship and obedience to you, God. And because we trust you. Oh God, even when we can't see our way, you have made a way. You have blessed us beyond measure, God. And so we give back just a small portion of what you have blessed us with because truth be told, God, you can do more with 10% than we ever thought we could with 90, God. And so we release the tithe to you joyfully, God, because we know you love a joyful giver. And so we give with joy, God. We ask, God, that you would bless those who have given but even more so, God, we ask, God, that you would bless those who desire to yearn in their hearts to give, but have it not at this time. Oh, God, that you would provide an opportunity for them to give, to partner with you, God. When it's all said and done, we'll take no credit, for the credit is yours, God. We ask, God, that you would show us how to be good stewards with the tithe, God, that you would direct us, God that we would provide resources for those in need, God. Oh God, that we would take no credit, God, because it's you that make it all possible. And so we thank you, God, for the blessing and the opportunity to give. We thank you for the resources. We thank you for all that we share in because of you. So we ask that you would continue, God, to guide us, to shape us, to mold us, and we give the credit to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
See, if I turn it on, it makes sound, right? There's a voice that cries out in the silence Searching for a heart that will love him Longing for a child that will give him their all Give it all, he wants it all There's a God that walks over the earth He's searching for a heart that is desperate Longing for a child that will give them their all Give it all, he wants it all And he said, love me, love me with your whole heart He wants it all today Serve me, serve me with your life now He wants it all today Bow down let go of your idols he wants it all today he wants it all today he wants it all today so give it all and there's a god who walks over the earth he's searching for a heart that is desperate Longing for a child that will give them their all Give it all, he wants it all And he says, love me, love me with your whole heart He wants it all today Serve me, serve me with your life now He wants it all today Oh, bow down he wants it all today he wants it all today he wants it all today so give it all all of you more of you he wants it all today So give it all And there's a voice that cries out in the silence He's searching for a heart that will love him Longing for a child that will give him their all Give it all He Todo, todo. God wants it all, all. Amen, amen. Um, this has been a powerful and celebratory Sunday, right? So um, I, we're all blessed by the dancer, right, who came forth. And then at eight o'clock, we had a spoken word artist who's also a friend of Shirley's. Amen. It's been an awesome celebratory Sunday, right? The last Sunday that we are celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month. I just want to invite us, though, in the midst of celebration, to be keenly and prophetically aware of those of us who come to worship with heavy hearts, right? And who come and who worship and uh, who see God even in the midst. And in that way, um, I want to lift up in a very particular way um, our young adult, Jeremy Tyler, and his mother, uh, Geraldine Tyler, um, Arthur Tyler, father of Jeremy, husband of 
Geraldine passed away on this week, Tim. And um, Jeremy is on this post this morning serving in his usual spot. And I tell you that because I understand people have different ways of grieving, right? But um, I just want to take a moment to honor Jeremy. Of all the young adults I've worked with, Jeremy has been the most dependable. And Jeremy has sown so much into other people's lives. To know Jeremy is to love him, right? Um, so during this time, I want us to respectfully, right, but be present for him, to pray for him, to undergird him and Sister Geraldine in the midst of this very difficult season that they're going through. Amen. And in the same way, you see our pastor, um, Elise Barrymore, is not here this morning. She is journeying with a friend and colleague of hers, also a friend of our community of faith, Reverend Joy Challenger Slaughter, uh, who lost her father and who was memorialized on yesterday out of state, right? So there's so much going on. I mean, you, you see us doing ministry, but pray for those who work in front of the scenes and behind the scenes, amen? Because we're trying to be present to everything. The, the word says to rejoice with those who rejoice, but also to mourn, right, with those who mourn, amen? So we're all called to do that together collectively, amen? Uh, on this morning, there is a word from the Lord. So if you give me the next couple of minutes, um, how are the tamales? For those of you who have okay. Um, they, they, they tend to have this effect, right? We, we, I'm going to preach on Acts chapter 10 today, and Peter goes into a trance. If I see any of you going into a trance, I'm going to have to prophetically call you out, amen? I know tamales can be, <laughs> they could be something, amen? Uh, but please join me in a word of prayer uh, for the word on this morning. God, we come before you, Lord. And as we have read in the book of Acts, God, as we've been journeying week by week, we've seen the work of your Holy Spirit, God. And even though your Holy Spirit is dependable, your Holy Spirit is not always predictable. And we thank you for that, God. We thank you that you don't always fit the molds and the boxes that we lay out for you. But sometimes you invite us to step beyond, God, even our own borders, even our own comfort zones, God. So right now, God, I step out in faith. And I believe, Lord God, that you'll speak through these words that have been prepared and prayed over so that Jesus could be glorified and your people can be edified. I pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. So this week we continue in the Mosaic community, right? We've been journeying uh, through the book of Acts, and I get to preach on one of my favorite texts, one of my favorite stories in Scripture, Acts chapter 10. And it's most known, right, for the powerful conversion experience of a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius, right? Centurion comes from the Latin centum, which means that this wasn't just any ordinary old soldier. This was a, a commander who was over 100 centum people, right, who, that he had under his authority. And it's such a significant portion of the text, right, because through his conversion experience, you begin to see the text take another direction. Right? The narrative begins to switch into another way. But I want to lodge it for a moment uh, within the broader context of the book of Acts, right? For those of you who've been journeying and, and reading, right, and uh, now in October, presumably in the second time around reading the text, I want to give you a quick outline that'll maybe help you understand and locate the story, right? Uh, the book of Acts could actually be divided into three parts. And these three parts correlate with Jesus' command to the disciples at the beginning in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He tells the disciples what? He tells them, uh, go and you will be my witnesses where? Do you remember? Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And this is the exact order that the narrative of the book of Acts follows. If you break it up this way, Acts chapter 1 through 8, they're in Jerusalem. Uh, Acts chapter 8, it picks up on verse 4 through uh, chapter 12. The ministry shifts to Judea and Samaria. And then finally, Acts chapter 13, all the way through the end, follows the journey of the Apostle Paul, his ministry, his multiple mission trips, his arrest, and him being taken to Rome. And then all of a sudden, we're left on a cliffhanger in Acts chapter 28 when he's in prison and still ministering, right? So if you were to break down each of these sections, right, it, it goes into kind of further detail in the stories back narrative uh, that is there. And I want us for a moment to go ahead and focus on that middle section, Acts chapter 8 through 12, because the conversion of Cornelius is important, but it's not the only one that happens. 
Uh, we learned last week in Acts chapter 8 that who was converted? The Ethiopian eunuch. And then Acts chapter 9, a fellow by the name of Saul, who had been persecuting the church, he's converted, and he goes on to become who? The Apostle Paul. So Acts chapter 10, Cornelius becomes the next movement of conversion, and the church shifts from being inward-focused, Jerusalem-focused, Jewish-focused, to begin to move out. But I've actually titled my sermon this morning, a preacher's conversion. What happens when a preacher converts or reconverts? Because I don't want us to focus so much on Cornelius this morning. I want us to focus on the apostle Peter. I believe Peter undergoes a conversion himself, and he begins the chapter in a certain way. I mean, this uh, fisherman turned disciple, turned apostle, turned preacher who thinks he's got it all figured out. And matter of fact, you know, maybe we don't blame Peter for having this attitude and this posture. I mean, after all, this is the same Peter who walked with Jesus the three years of his ministry. It's the same Peter who walked on water. A couple of moments, almost drowns, but he walked. I don't know of anyone else since him that's walked. Don't try it at home, right? Uh, and and, and uh, this is also the same Peter who practiced conceal and carry before there was a legal license for it. I mean, he was packing a knife and he wasn't afraid to use it, right? And, and it's also the same Peter, right, as Sister Kirsten uh, hinted to, that his name in the Greek, Cephas, means rock. And Jesus looks at him and says, upon this rock, I will build my church, so this guy, he's got all the credentials, right? But, but by the end of chapter 10, Peter undergoes a serious clinic in the school of humility. He begins one way, and then he ends in a very different way. Uh, and, 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 and by the end, it's not just Cornelius and his household that come to Christ. Peter and his crew that goes with him have their own come-to-Jesus moments. Now, let me clarify, I'm not being hard on Peter. I like Peter. I enjoy Peter. And a matter of fact, for me, Peter functions like a narrative mirror that you and I as readers, we can see the best, the worst, and the average of our own human nature reflected in him. Uh, and I'll offer one example. Uh, Peter seems to be the kind of guy uh, that would... Um, have a profile on Facebook where he doesn't show his picture, doesn't show any of his information. Uh, Peter believes the world is kind of a sketchy place, right? I mean, he, uh, uh, some people, he holds them at arm's length and much more strangers. And the ironic thing is, even when God gives him all the directions ahead of time, even when God tells him to trust a specific group of pe people, Peter just kind of keeps being Peter. And we see it in the text, right? In verse 19 of Acts chapter 10, uh, Peter just had this very powerful vision, right? And we'll get into that in a bit. Uh, but then the Holy Spirit speaks to Peter and says, Simon, he calls him by his own name. Yo, I know what you were before you were Peter. <laughs> says, uh, get up and go downstairs. Don't hesitate to go with three men who are looking for you because I have sent them. And what does Peter do? Surely enough, he goes downstairs and he meets his men and he says, I'm the one that you're looking for. Uh, what do you want? And then the men give their reasons, right? They, they say that they come from Cornelius the centurion. They describe him as a righteous and God-fearing man. He's respected by the Jewish people. And a holy angel appeared to Cornelius and told him to go uh, and send messengers to the house so that they can invite Peter so that Peter could go preach. So Peter reluctantly follows instructions, but he places some safeguards for himself. Check out verse 23. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. In other words, Peter's like, yeah, I'll go with you, but I'm going to take my crew just in case. I don't know where you live. I don't know what zip code you all are going to take me through. I'm going to roll up my windows and take my armor bearers with me just in case, right? And he goes and he does this, right, with his safeguards. And 
Peter shows up at the house, and in verse 25, right, he encounters and he meets Cornelius. Uh, Cornelius kneels out of reverence, right? Peter tells him to get up, and then uh, they go inside of the house of Cornelius, and in verse uh, 27, he meets this whole crowd of people who are waiting, right, to hear what Peter is going to preach. They're waiting on him to talk and check out what Peter says. He gives him a disclaimer. Uh, you all know I'm not supposed to be here. Verse 28, you are well aware that it's against the law for a Jew to associate or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objections. May I ask why you have sent for me? They just told you they want you to preach. <laughs> and you're still questioning why you're there. This is Peter in all of his Peterific glory, right? But I love it because for me, he embodies the legacy of the reluctant prophet, the reluctant leader, the reluctant preacher. It's a biblical archetype. You can think of Moses. You can think of Gideon. You can think of Jonah, right? These are the people that uh, I think of a social media meme. We all, we've all heard of the, the footprints in the sand, right? It says, when you see one footprint, my child, it's because I was carrying you. There's another version that says, and when you see that long groove, I had to drag you along, Right? So there's some people like that. God kind of has to kind of drag them along. And, you know, the invitation is the Holy Spirit can work with your questions, you can work with your doubts, you can work with your fear, do it afraid, but the call is obey, do it, right? And on last Sunday, we heard Father Memo talk about how every Christian should have a what? A mission. And here we see how the Holy Spirit converts Peter's sense of mission and ends up converting his very ministry. And it begins uh, here very early in the text in chapter 10. The Holy Spirit starts working on Peter uh, by messing with his lodging accommodations. Have you ever made a reservation to stay somewhere and it looks very pretty online and it looks a certain way and then you show up and the door is a little rusty and you look at the mattress and it kind of, you know, it kind of looks like someone took a chunk out of it and, you know, you're, you're kind of there and you're like, okay, not exactly what I expected. And this is what happens with Peter, right? Uh, in verse 6 and verse 32, it says that he stays in the home of another Simon, and this is Simon the Tanner. I don't know if you're familiar with the profession of tanning, right? I was watching a video. Uh, it was in Spanish, and it was called uh, The Last Tanner of Spain. This very uh, old man, right, who uh, was practicing the uh, art of tanning, right, of taking animal skins and hides and making leather, and he was doing it the old-fashioned way. And the, the the video was so kind of romanticizing, you know, you know, when he dies, it's gonna die out with him because there's no one else to learn, and it's going out of practice. Well, guess what? In the Bible, a tanner together with a tax collector was about the worst profession you could get. It was one that was looked down upon. People, if, if you were a tanner, everyone knew it. And this is why an encyclopedia uh, describes it this way. Before tanning, the animal skins are unhaired, degreased, desalted, and soaked in water for a period of six hours to two days. Historically, this process was considered a nauseous or a fancy word, odiferous trade. It's very fancy for it. it smelled bad. And tanners were relegated to the outskirts of town. And we see it in the text, verse 6 to 32 says, Simon the tanner whose house was by the sea. This isn't SpongeBob. This is where this man lived. He lived all the way on the edge. So not only is he physically isolated, but because this man lived in a Jewish community and he handled blood, this man was also religiously isolated. Read Leviticus chapter 10 when you, uh, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 11 when you get a chance. It's fun to read. Uh, it lists 14 ways that you could become ceremonially unclean by handing a dead animal. And if you handled a dead animal in any way, you were kind of religiously exiled from the community. You were considered the polar opposite of holy. You could not be near anything or anyone that was consecrated holy. You had to just kind of wait on the outside until a sacrifice was made on your behalf and you were ceremonially clean again. So this man lives on the edge because he smells, because he's unholy. And God says to Peter, no, you're not going to the Ritz-Carlton. You're going to the half-star 
motel on the edge of town to live with Simon the Tanner until I tell you otherwise. So this is how God begins to mess with Peter. And this is the first thing he converts. The Holy Spirit converts Peter's sense of place, his choice of place. And if we're honest, when we ask God to call us and to send us somewhere, we like to be comfortable. Why not? We like to make sure that uh, we have our bags packed, that we've got everything with us, and we like to be in style and in comfort. Nothing wrong with that. But if God tells you you're not going to the Ritz-Carlton, you're going to the motel, will we go anyway? So Peter's uh, conversion continues, right? God converts his sense of place. And then uh, it says in verse 9 that Peter has this vision while he's at the house of Simon the Tanner. He's uh, on the rooftop and he's hungry. And the Bible says he fell into a trance. And in verse 11, he saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being lowered to the earth and then it says it contained all kinds of four-footed animals it sounds more like a nightmare right uh, reptiles and birds and uh, god says to peter peter get up kill and eat by the way whenever i joke and mess around with pastor lise about uh, being a vegetarian or not i was like pastor lise i'm just being biblical it says get up kill and eat right this is, uh, this is my thoughts right uh, i'm, I'm don't, don't give me my pink, pink slip during this week, please. Uh, but it, 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 he tells him, get up and kill and eat these animals that are ceremonially unclean. And I love that it happens three times. God tends to work with Peter in sets of three. Peter denies Jesus in the Gospels, what, three times? At the end of the Gospel of John, Jesus asks Peter, do you love me three times? So just to make sure that he gets it, uh, God shows it to him three times. I, I, love, I love how the text is in conversation, right? But here's the significance uh, that's a little bit deeper with the animals. The, 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 the fact that uh, God tells him, get up and engage with these animals, right? And he puts it in front of them. What we need to study and learn in the text is that certain animals served as category of insult and discrimination, the Jews had a binary understanding of humanity. We are God's chosen and holy people, and then there's you all. And for certain groups of people, it's historically proven that the Canaanites and Sumerians, for example, the Jews would call them dogs because it was an insult. A dog was an unholy and impure animal. So by God telling Peter, get up, kill, and eat, he doesn't just give them permission uh, to eat rib tips and chitlins. And tamales, I guess, if they existed back then. But, but, but he, he, he's really telling him, this category that you had to label in the group and to discriminate into other people, I'm disarming it for you. You can no longer use it as a source of insult and discrimination. So we see that uh, God converts his sense of place, but then God cons converts his sense of palate. What Peter considered to be tasteful and distasteful, uh, clean and unclean, on the menu and off the menu, God changes it in a moment. But here's one more piece with that vision that I love, right? We could also interpret it this way. God is telling Peter, you know what? Just eat what's in front of you. Learn to eat what's in front of you. He's in the house of this tanner. Who knows what he was being served? And I love this invitation in the text because if you've ever experienced an Emmaus mission trip, and I'll come back to that language of mission, Emmaus, we learn to eat what's put in front of us, amen? <laughs> You go to Baja California and uh, work at the orphanage, right? For about 10 days, we go there. We learn to eat what has been put in front of us, saints. You may have pancakes in the morning, and guess what? If there's leftover, you're going to have pancakes with something else at lunch. And if there's leftover there, you may even have pancakes for dinner, right, with a side of something else. But we learn to eat what has been put in front of us. Gluten-free, lactose-free, keto, uh, Whole30, whatever it is, right? We suspend it for that moment because we have been invited to the table. We are in the guests of the house of someone, and we learn to be grateful for what is put in front of us. I remember on one trip, on one occasion, um, uh, there was, a, there was a, a saint who went along and who was having a hard time with the meal and who was complaining and Pastor Elise very graciously gave up her plate for this person. 
And I'll never forget the example of humility that that was for me because that showed me, right? Here we just worked with a group of people that have no choice what to eat. And when we get back home, we have the option to go to our fridge, order takeout, go to Uber Eats, whatever it is. And we learn the lesson, saints, to be humble and to take what is put in front of us, right? So again, that's another area where Peter is converted. He's converted in his palate. God deals with what he categorizes as good and not good. The third conversion for Peter is his pulpit. And for any preacher, for God to mess with your pulpit, right? And that's some dangerous language when you think the pulpit is yours. A couple of years ago, I had the privilege of taking an intensive course with uh, uh, Dr. Frank Anthony Thomas. Some of you may know who he is. And he would talk about the privilege of standing behind the sacred desk, and his challenge would be, when did we as preachers think that the pulpit was ours and that we're not being invited to it, and it's a privilege to stand behind it each and every single time, the sacred desk, right? So Peter, I think by this point in the text, God has to mess with his sense of the pulpit because if you think back to Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit falls, right? And Peter preaches this amazing sermon and he preaches on sin and on repentance. And then the people say, what must we do to be saved? And 3,000 people are converted in one day and then they're baptized and they become a part of the community. Peter thought he was something, and he began to organize a formula. If I do this, then this happens, then God does that, boom, we're done. I've got my method figured out. But I love this portion of the text, right, because God begins to mess not only with how he preaches, and I'll get to that, but with who he preaches to. Peter thought he was only called to the Jews, but then all of a sudden God picks this Roman centurion. And what I love about the Bible is there's a pattern with centurions. For those of you who have been reading the text, in the Gospels, it's a centurion who has a sick servant. And when he meets Jesus, he says, you know what, Jesus, I know you. You don't even have to go to my house. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus says, I have not encountered such great faith in all of Israel. And then when Jesus dies on the cross, the text says that a centurion was standing there and says, surely this was the son of God. So there's something about centurions get it before other people get it. And saints, what happens when God chooses to work in and through people who would not be considered church appropriate what happens when god begins to reach out to the unchurched and the unsaved and doesn't ask for our permission first uh, don't get me wrong salvation and church are important but all that peter did was introduce to cornelius one piece that he was missing and it would be arrogant for peter to think that god wasn't already at work in cornelius's life before he showed up and saints, this is where we have begun to shift our language and we become a little bit more humble because we no longer call them mission trips. We call them global or global partnerships. The reason why in a traditional mission trip, there are power dynamics at work, saints. I, as the missionary, show up. I've got the answers. I've got the resources. I've got the way to help out you poor people. And as I'm doing this, as I'm making this for you, by the way, let me take an Instagram picture to upload. I was here. Hashtag blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, 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 and the mission trip dynamic is that you're here and the people you serve are here. But that's not the case. We need to recognize the Holy Spirit was already at work there long before we showed up. And the Holy Spirit will continue to work long after we are gone. So we show up with humility and with partnership, right? The places we have gone to, the people that we have served have poured into us just as much as we have poured back into them. We've learned from their example, from their hard work, from their ingenuity, from their creativity. And we come away walking back and coming here to the States and saying, wow, we were blessed just as much as we were a source of blessing. So God converts Peter's pulpit. But then the last piece I have for you is that God converts Peter's program. I stated earlier that Peter began to get into a 
preaching rhythm, right? He had his intro, his three points, his conclusion, his celebration all worked out. He knew when he was going to do the altar call, but something happens in verse 44, and this is my absolute favorite part of the text. It says this in verse 44. He's doing his elaborate, his amazing sermon, and then all of a sudden in verse 44 it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, so he hadn't got into his first, second, or third clothes, hadn't done an altar call yet, nothing. It says, the Holy Spirit came on all those who heard the message. And it says, the circumcised believers who were with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter says, surely no one can stand in their way of being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with him for a few days. I love this portion of the text because it shows that the Holy Spirit has the ability to jump over walls, uh, to cross over rivers. The Holy Spirit has the ability to kind of squeeze out of tight spaces that we put the Spirit in and say, we got you figured out. We know how you work. We know when to see you coming, when to see you going. And the Holy Spirit just kind of manages to slip away and say, you are not going to limit how I'm going to work. So the Holy Spirit jumps the gun before the altar call, before the prayer of confession, before the Romans road to salvation. The Holy Spirit's like, I'm just going to boom, fill these people, because if you keep talking another minute, they're going to fall asleep or leave. Like now. No, I'm kidding. Um, but the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to interrupt. And what I love about the interruptions of the Holy Spirit, it's not that our plans and our programs are bad, saints. That's not it. It's that the Holy Spirit in that moment wants to do something better. And are we willing to surrender our space? Are we willing to surrender our program? Are we willing to surrender what we think is ours and the Holy Spirit just let us borrow? I close with this story on last week. We're privileged to have one of my mentors, Guillermo Campuzano, come from the United Nations and preach here, right? And two years ago, another mentor of mine, actually the man that I received my sense of calling through, Pastor Fernando Sosa, came from Mexico He's a man with over 40 years of full-time ministry, and the Lord has used him to establish over 100 missional churches. So what that means is in Mexico, throughout Latin America, in Morocco, and in Spain, the churches that are there that are under his covering, it's not that someone had a church is like, whoa, your ministry is growing. Can I sneak in? No. They began as missionaries going out and saying, yeah, you're awesome and you're talented here, but there's a need over there. You, you're gifted and you're talented, but let's send you out over here and by faith, send, 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 until it became a movement. This movement exploded in the 90s. There was a powerful revival, powerful move of the Holy Spirit where literal signs, wonders, and miracles began to happen. But it began to happen because of Fernando Sosa's obedience. One occasion, he was invited to one of the most important conferences, Christian ministry conferences in Mexico. And for weeks, he had been praying and fasting and preparing this awesome sermon. He already had it all written out. He had it rehearsed. He was excited, looking forward to preaching it. And it's right as he gets to the pulpit, the Holy Spirit says, you know what? That's cute. But if you leave it to the side for one moment, see what I could do. And for the house, I was like, what? But he obeyed. And by the end of that night, signs, wonders, and miracles had taken place to the extent where people who were rolled in on wheelchairs, the wheelchairs were empty and they walked out. People were healed. People were saved. There was powerful things that happened in that gathering. And then when Fernando Sosa tells that story, he ends it by saying this, imagine if I had preached my sermon. Imagine if I had insisted and told the Holy Spirit, I know better than you. What would have not happened if he had not obeyed? And saints, this is my invitation. I'm excited about where we are and about where we're going. But let's not be surprised if the Holy Spirit decides to interrupt things. 
Let's not be surprised if the timeline changes just a little bit. Let's not be surprised if the Holy Spirit begins to call people out of places and spaces that we never would have expected. If he raises people up that didn't go uh, through the classes and through the methods and to the institutions and the Holy Spirit just begins to raise people up, will we receive them? Will we allow the Holy Spirit to convert our way of thinking and being people of faith? Are you ready for that to happen? Ready or not, it's coming, I believe. Amen? So this is the word of God for the people of God's saints. Thanks be to God. Amen. Man, I'm going to invite us to stretch across the aisles to join hands as we have on every Sunday. And on this day, again, just be reminded in the midst of celebration to be sensitive, to uh, have your heart go out to people who are in need. Um, be aware, again, that we especially need your help around candy craze, right? It's a big push. It's a big outreach to the community. We usually serve over 300 people, so that's an opportunity to plug in and to be prophetic and to be participatory. Then also um, uh, the sign-up sheets, right? The small sign-up sheets are on the table to help out with candy craze. Then again, if you're interested about learning more to journey with our Emmaus community of faith, please see Kirsten Mahone for more information on that. I want you to look at the person next to you and tell them, eres una luz. All right, fine. If you want to do it in English, you are a light on the hill. Shine brightly in your homes, your places of work. And even when you don't think anyone is looking, even when you don't think you are worthy, you are taking the next step into a great journey. Invite your friends to go with you. Move onward and upward. Christ living in you is the hope of the world. There is no other plan. So go out and be who God is calling you to be. You are more ready than you realize. Amen. Amen. Hug someone on your way out. Check in at the Fusion Cafe table.